um, both, I mean, all the associated social causes, both in the fields and in the city, um, from you, Brett, and, and, and hopefully um, be more familiar now, by now with the story from um, improving pay and uh, working conditions for the farm workers to also fighting for bilingual education and greater access to um, higher education for the Latino community. Um, he is the com was co-founder of Obreros Unidos, former CEO of United Migrant Opportunity Services, regent of the University of Wisconsin. Has a, uh, he was a, more than 20 years teaching at the Milwaukee Area Technical College, MATC. Um, he was part of the directors of Voces de la Frontera, responsible for creating the Voces de la Frontera Action Program, their advocacy arm. Uh, and he has a book, as Hako was saying, coming out soon, uh, whose uh, title is The Legacy of the Wisconsin Farm Workers Movement. So stay tuned for that one. It's, it's coming out soon uh, with the historical, um, Wisconsin Historical Society Press. Jesus has been incredible generous with his time, um, meeting with Jacobo, the students, myself, multiple times. Um, he has learned materials for the exhibit, and uh, it has been an incredible honor uh, to be able to meet him, to spend time with him, to learn from him. Um, and yeah, thank you, thank you so much, Jesus. So without further ado, the man himself. <laughs> And uh, those of you that aren't, weren't able to get up to the second floor, I just wanted to, uh, as I visited uh, the professor's offices, these uh, the images that you have of the industrial setting of these workers, uh, you're going to see more workers here uh, uh, in the images that are going to be made available to you. They're not the same that are, uh, that are in the exhibit. There are going to be some, uh, some uh, newer ones, different ones. Uh, some of the same events, some are not. But in the second floor, there's images of the, in the field, of families working in the fields of, uh, and that reminded me so much of uh, my experience and of the experience that we're trying to capture. So thank you very much for uh, 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 those uh, uh, section of that exhibit, if you have the time. I don't want to invite somebody to the second floor that is not available to go up, but <laughs> sometimes you should go up there and, uh, and see those images. You know, there's some, uh, there's some stories that have, uh, flashbacks, or that is, uh, don't necessarily follow a chronological time or a linear, uh, a linear experience. And this is going to be one of them, because I think that this is the best way to, uh, to explain it to you. We're first going to talk about the migrant stream that brought us here to the state of Wisconsin and to the Great Lakes region. If you see that, uh, that image at the bottom uh, of the, uh, 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 of South Texas. That is uh, 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 the homestead of my grandfather in 1906 when he crosses from the state of Coahuila just 30 miles into a, 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 a region that is presently known as the Winter Garden, the Winter Garden area. Actually, it's semi-arid, it's almost desert-like. But what brought, him, what brought him to that area, the city of Crystal City, uh, Texas, was our teaching water. They had discovered artesian water, and heretofore they had always depended on the streams. You see the, the, Rio, the Rio Grande, the present border between the United States and Mexico, and then the next river that flows into the Gulf, the Nueces River. In between there, that agricultural region depended exclusively on, uh, on very few, very few drops of rain a year and whatever water they could pump out of those, uh, those rivers. But with artesian water, they started bringing, they started bringing uh, 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 farm workers from across the border. In 1906, my, uh, my father, my grandfather came and, a ver, profesora, no quiere moverse esta cosa. There we go. And this is the uh, this is the four county area that uh, with very few tools, these individuals who settled there, who settled there, uh, uh, converted into a winter garden. That's a, that's the uh, that's the name of the region at this time. Uh, it includes in the lower left hand corner in blue 
Savala, Savala County. But let me show you how this, uh, how this population is. If you look at the 1900 census when my grandfather came, of the 750,000 acre county of Savala, these huge tracts of land, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, 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 map doesn't do justice just to the size of it, the scope of the land that we're talking about. Uh, the 750,000 acres are about one person. Uh, uh, very few people that, uh, that settled in this area. There was nobody there. But look, as, look what happened in that recruitment of, uh, of farm workers to come into the area. Savala County goes from less than 1,000 to 10,000 in two decades. Uh, La Salle County uh, from 2,000 to 8,000. Frio from uh, 4,000 double in size. Uh, Timid County like uh, uh, Savala County increases almost 800. Uh, 800%. And you notice afterwards, afterwards, the Great Depression dislocates this whole arrangement. My grandfather thought that uh, that he was going to end up uh, being a part owner. He His arrangement, the working arrangement, was as medieros. They were sharecroppers. In other words, they were working for these land speculators, and they shared in the bounty of the land itself. And, uh, and when the uh, economic... Uh, Depression uh, 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 occurred, it dislocated this whole relationship, and then the migration started out of that region. And you notice by the census in 30 and 40 and 50, although continuous people continue to come into the region, the population doesn't change. Why? Because this migration continues to come. And if you look at that original map that I showed you of this uh, large migration into the uh, Great Lakes region, uh, uh, hundreds, literally hundreds of thousands of people were fleeing this area looking for work. Uh, 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 Kerry McWilliams, an author of a book named North of Mexico, called this a push and pull theory. Or that is, the Mexican Revolution uh, begins in 1910, even though uh, 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 there is an attempt to set a democratic governor, Madero is uh, assassinated, chaos continues, and it just you don't have to recruit any more Mexicans. They're just fleeing the chaos that uh, that uh, that follows. And there's not enough housing. There's not enough. Uh, I, I took a picture. And by the way, this I'll be making references, and I, I love the fact that students are involved. So I'm, I'm going to be making references to this because they're so intent on learning so much about this uh, history. These pictures were taken by the Farmer Service Administration, and they come into Savala County during the Depression. And uh, I have a whole series of pictures on this. And I, I didn't show the pictures of the children with extended uh, uh, bellies, you know, in other words, suffering from malnutrition. Uh, but I chose this one uh, uh, because it just shows the, the, uh, the uh, inadequate uh, uh, conditions. I, I couldn't even call it a home. I identified this as a shelter. Anyway, you're, uh, you, if you look into the Farmer Service Administration, uh, you'll find the conditions that uh, these uh, individuals were fleeing from and recruiters from, uh, from the Midwestern uh, region recruiting their labor. As uh, those, uh, those land speculators that had uh, recruit Mexican laborers to come into the Winter Garden area, now uh, 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 the Great Lakes region processor, canning company growers, etc., cetera, are, uh, uh, want these experienced farm workers to come in and uh, what we do, and uh, I, I, I am a third generation, that is my father gets here in the 1940s. Uh, he, they're hoeing and feeding sugar beets uh, uh, in uh, uh, west of the Kettle Moraine area. My, uh, my second oldest brother, uh, Teofilo Carlos, is born in, uh, in Hartford, Wisconsin in 1942. But as you know, the, the uh, Japanese uh, uh, army had attacked us uh, the previous December war had started, so my uncle, who had just turned 18, uh, 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 had to sign up for the Selective Service. And he signs up in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. He gets a, a letter from the Selective Service, and oh, it's time to go to Texas. I have to report to the, uh, uh, for the Selective uh, Service. He gets to Texas, he says, no, Julian, you signed up in, uh, in uh, Fond du Lac. You go with the Wisconsin Red Arrow Division, so we accompany the boys from Wisconsin. Uh, in the battles in the Pacific and uh, disarms the Japanese army in the occupation of, the, of, of, of Japan. That's the second generation of migrant workers. The third generation, we, my father, my mother, the two children that had been born and four more, I followed uh, uh, Teofilo who was born in, Car 
in, uh, in Harford. I was born in 1943. And uh, three more children, we started in the 50s. We, my parents and other migrant workers who had uh, uh, been coming up to the Midwest couldn't travel during the war. Gas was rationed, parts were difficult to come by. All of the uh, industries was for the war, as it should have been. And so we don't, uh, uh, we don't, uh, they don't come up uh, to the Midwest until the 50s. And now we're an eight-member family. Six boys, no uh, girls, unfortunately. Uh, 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 and my mom and dad, neighbors and friends. And we started out uh, 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 right, uh, 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 the, the migration in the 50s. But as I said that I would uh, uh, not follow a chronological order, we'll go back to the border. And some of the uh, issues that are coming up in the border that compels. I remember we're talking about a push and pull theory, okay? So one of the, uh, one of the chaos that goes along with this experience of Mexican Americans, uh, now my grandfather has been there since 1906, the depression is in the 1930s, but there's uh, a repatriation. And you have this image on the right hand side of what President uh, Trump would call bad people, right? They're being sent back to Mexico, including those American-born children. That's why the word repatriation is inappropriate, because all those children are Americans. They were born here in, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, 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 country. So here they're having a hard trouble. I looked up in the uh, 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 immigration services, and immigration services said there's only 82,000 people who were repatriated. But if you look at some of the history of California, New Mexico, Texas, where the, uh, where the uh, repatriation was led, not by the immigration services, but by thugs, by vigilantes who were chasing, who were scapegoating Mexicans for taking over their jobs. There were no jobs for anybody. Uh, 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 but they were chasing Mexicans back into uh, uh, so-called their country, even those children that, uh, that had been born, uh, that had been born here. Now, going back uh, to this period of time before we started migrating, this, I, I wanted to include this image because it just shows you the schizophrenia uh, 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 of immigration policies then as it is now. We're opening up the, uh, the border for refugees uh, that Trump had set in uh, uh, using the pandemic as, a, uh, as, a, uh, as an excuse uh, for detaining those individuals to come in and apply. And in the border, not only uh, uh, Mexicans, uh, Haitians, but now uh, Ukrainians by the thousands, Russians who are fleeing uh, uh, the oppression in their government. And uh, we're about to uh, open the uh, uh, government says, oh, don't do it. Uh, anybody that approves of that uh, policy uh, is gonna lose their election. We don't want, uh, in spite of the fact that there's job openings, the economy is just booming. There's uh, jobs available in all sectors of the economy. We don't want to accept any uh, refugees. Well, here we are during the war, millions of soldiers, men and women in uniform, and nobody to work in our factories. Make a treaty with the United, with, uh, the United States makes a treaty with Mexico to allow uh, uh, braceros, braceros on the word brazos, right? Uh, as arms, hands, literally, to come in and work in the fields and in the factories. We got so used to this guest, the workers. Now, these guys weren't, uh, mostly male workers weren't uh, eligible for uh, citizenship. And we like that, right? We like people to come in and, uh, and, uh, and work in our fields, but we don't want to grant them any rights. And these individuals didn't have any. But we got used to them, right? So we started out with about 40, 50,000 of them coming in the Second World War. Uh, this didn't end until 1965 when the Immigration uh, Act was, uh, was uh, acted upon during the Johnson administration and the Bracero uh, uh, program ended, and we uh, went into a refugee program where we granted individuals not only from Mexico but from other countries the right to come in, but over a period of time uh, to, earn, uh, to earn citizenship. The area that my grandfather grew in, uh, 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 I, uh, uh, during the book, I, uh, am f I'm uh, fighting with my author because I use the term apartheid. I said, I grew up in, uh, in a system of apartheid in, uh, along the Texas border. Oh, he says, I don't know if that's the most appropriate term to use. What do you mean? Uh, apartheid, the people of your readers are gonna relate it to uh, Africa. But this is the United States. I said, well, wait a minute, let's look it up in the dictionary. It means apartheid means the segregation, social segregation, political segregation, civic segregation, even our burial grounds. Uh, were segregated. That was what called the Panteon Benito Juarez, and theirs was called Evergreen. Uh, 
Uh, uh, this is a, a, a World War II camp. We had the community of, uh, of uh, establishing a, uh, an internment camp in our community in Crystal City, Texas, to uh, house uh, 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 primarily Japanese, but some Germans. This, uh, this prisoner of war camp, this internment camp was unique in that we wanted to use these families to barter with the Axis government in, a, in an exchange program. We'll trade you Japanese uh, uh, that you might want uh, if you uh, 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 allow us to uh, bring home some of the soldiers or uh, uh, diplomats that you have uh, as, uh, as prisoners of war. Didn't work out very well, uh, but uh, you can see, uh, you can see, uh, what are we going to do with a prisoner of war camp uh, after the war ended? Well, that building in the forefront was my elementary school. And, uh, and uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, I never went to school. I never, I never sat in a, in a classroom with somebody other than Mexican children. In, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in this uh, former uh, uh, prison of work. Now the, the towers were, were turned down and the barbed wire was removed, but it felt like a prison of work. Let me tell you. Uh, uh, in the sixth grade, in the sixth grade, uh, in middle school, the, uh, the, the segregation uh, school uh, uh, board, the segregation uh, 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 had started. So the way they uh, segregated was is that in sixth grade, there were four levels of sin trade. Uh, uh, Non-Mexicans occupied 6-1. Uh, 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 Mexicans that didn't look like myself, 6-2. And those of us that were migrant workers, uh, six three or six four. So even though the schools were integrated as such, there was no relationship between primarily we, who were migrant workers, and the rest of the uh, of the uh, uh, children of the of the former colonists. Well, my dad, my dad was insistent on we getting an education where there had already been in our family three generations of farm worker. He didn't want a fourth one to come about. So uh, uh, everywhere we went. He would put us in school, which was really challenging for us because uh, we were the only Mexicans in uh, the whole school system. In Henry Illinois, Pickett Fergus, I graduated from eighth grade Henry Illinois uh, 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 Elementary School while we were picking asparagus. In my uh, freshman year in high school, I went to three high schools. I went to high, uh, high school while we were picking asparagus in Henry Illinois, while we were picking cucumbers in Watoma, Wisconsin, and then back home in uh, Crystal City, uh, Texas. So, my dad said, "Well, that's enough. Uh, uh, we're going to resettle in. Uh, we're going to resettle in Wisconsin, and uh, it was almost the first strike I ever participated. Nobody wanted to stay in Wisconsin. We all tied to our families, our siblings. Some of us had girlfriends back uh, back home. Uh, 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 but anyway, he said, no, 'No, no, we got to stay there. You're going to get a better education there.' So I graduated from high school in '61, and my brother at that time all he needed a high school diploma." Uh, uh, to go into the uh, state college system, so I followed my brother. And in the summer, um, we were, the, the venue that we used to resettle in Watoma was a, uh, a Mexican resident. And so I was selling tacos, and these people from the Wisconsin Division of Children and Youth come over there and says, you want to sell us these, be a migrant worker? Yeah, we want to start a daycare program for migrant children. And will you help us go and recruit? Well, here I am. Uh, I, I did everything except ride the bus. Uh, ride the bus. Uh, here we're taking children uh, uh, right after getting them off the, the bus into uh, the Red Granite. We started off with one classroom in Red Granite, Wisconsin. In three years, we had uh, we had uh, seven centers and over 150 children. Now, after 10 years of migrating in the fields, now I go back not as a migrant worker to the labor camps. But to try and get the parents to send their children, get them out of the fields, and to send them to Las Escuelitas, right? These little, these little schools, and uh, and it's working. But what else is happening is they they start telling me about their miserable wages that they're earning, and we I never knew how much we earned, or we didn't earn when I was in uh, uh, working those ten years as a migrant worker. We all worked collectively. Nobody had any individual checks. All eight of us that worked, or six of us. But my mom and dad all got paid with one uh, with one source of funds and one check. Uh, uh, but then the workers started telling them about that, showing me the, the living conditions, the overcrowded conditions, uh, uh, et cetera. And that's when the idea of doing something about those, other than children, started. So if you say, well, how can a 21 organize all these thousands of workers in central Wisconsin? Well, I had been at, uh, working with them for 10 years, and then I go back these three or four years and then in 1965, an extraordinary thing happens. The Office of Economic Opportunity funds United Migrant Opportunity Services, or that is, 
a center to, to uh, do daycare, and it also found, uh, funds the University of Wisconsin Poverty Institute. And there was a woman there, the daughter of Louis Brandeis, uh, from the, I'm talking Louis Brandeis Supreme Court Justice, who was a professor of economics. She wanted to do a study of the migrant wages and working conditions. All this progressive legislation that we had in the state of Wisconsin, she knew that the peace rate system didn't equal the uh, minimum wage that was set in law. She knew that the housing court that Wisconsin uh, 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 had, one of the few states that had a housing court for migrant workers, uh, was going uninspected. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, migrant housing that was inadequate uh, uh, was, not being, uh, was not being shut down. There had never been all these years of migrant workers working in the fields. Never had been a migrant worker that was injured. And you know, anybody that's ever worked with our agricultural implements knows that there are that there are accidents. So, in spite of the fact of this wonderful history of legislation, social and progressive legislation, I learned from her because she hired me in a wage study, and that's when I found that's what we gotta do. We gotta we gotta enforce the laws of the state of Wisconsin among the, the migrant workers. So I'm uh, 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 in Madison in the winter of '65, uh, 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 publishing, finishing uh, the wage uh, uh, study. And uh, this gentleman from uh, uh, one of the graduate schools says, did you see this picture in California of what the farm workers are doing? They're marching from Daleno, California to, uh, to uh, 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 Sacramento to improve their working and living conditions. So that's when uh, I decided that's what we need to do. So I got on the phone. At that time, by the way, guys, especially young and new youngsters, there used to be operators in the phone system. <laughs> and so I got, on the, I got on the phone, operator, person to person call with Cesar Chavez. I didn't know him from that, and I never met him in my life. And I said, hey, I've been reading about you. I got this paper from LA. And I told him what I'd been working on. I did a former migrant worker. And, uh, and I had been, uh, done this wage study and uh, knew about the need to enforce uh, uh, the wages and working conditions of migrant workers as part of the Wisconsin law. And I said, can we use the Thunderbird symbol? That symbol, I was so fascinated with the pre-Columbian symbol of the farm workers, you see that? That one right there. So he said, you go ahead. I says, you know, I need your help, Chavez says. Uh, 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 you can go ahead and use the banner of the farm workers in California, but will you help us with the boycott? And then he, that was a great boycott. Then he explains to me that Wisconsin law covers farm workers. We can organize unions here. Farm workers are not excluded, but in all the rest of the 48 states, except for Hawaii and Wisconsin, they don't have the right. The only way that they can get the growers to come in and negotiate the contract is through a great boycott. I said, sure, we'll help you. He says, you know, it's also wines. Wisconsin drinks more wine per capita than any person else <laughs> in the United States. I said, well, I don't know if we're gonna be able to change drinking habits. I said, well, we're certainly trying. We're certainly trying. We're certainly trying to uh, stop it from, uh, from eating grapes. So then every year after that, oh, well, by the way, let me just say in Spanish, this is juntarnos para ser reconocidos, let's come together to be recognized, hablar para ser oídos, let's speak so that we can be heard. Yeah, our people have a cause, la raza tiene causa. So the combination of using raza for, to describe our people, that, uh, that symbol of the farm workers becomes really a national movement. Those terms are used throughout, uh, but we introduce them. And, uh, and here we are. We didn't want to put the, the time or the place where we were going to meet because we were afraid, to tell you the truth. What was going to happen to the workers if they rallied and planned to go on a march, right? They'd, they'd be fired and we all lived in labor camps. They'd be thrown out of the labor camp into the street and we didn't want that to happen. So we didn't put down, it's all word of mouth. It's all word of mouth. And uh, look at the hundreds of people that show up for the rally. Then at the rally, we went to protest march for 80 miles. But we don't want anybody more than one per family and only one individual per labor camp. Why? We don't want the whole labor camp or whole families to be thrown out for not showing up to work. And so you'll find out some of the women wanted to march and they got mad at me because we didn't uh, allow that. That's going to happen in, in, uh, when we get to Milwaukee, by the way. But, uh, but uh, we didn't know where we were going to relieve ourselves. We actually had no idea how much water you consumed by marching 80 miles, I mean 20 miles a day that we needed. We didn't know that you needed Vaseline for, 
for you know if you march 20 hours you know what you use that for <laughs> but anyway we uh we're marching 20 miles a day and uh and uh, uh, uh that fall uh, after the march uh, after the march uh, workers are calling me up from hartford wisconsin from Van Alma, wisconsin come on and help us do that i didn't have a car i had to use my uh, my father's second uh, second car one of my brother's car and uh, I decided to go and respond to the potato processes. That was only in Alma, Wisconsin, about 15 miles away. So again, inexperienced, just like we were inexperienced about the mark. Where uh, somebody told me from the School for Workers at the University of Extension that you do two things in order to get recognized for anything. You get them to sign union cards or you have an election. And you win the election and the individual employer has to negotiate. So here we are, we're getting workers to, I mean, workers to sign uh, cards and the, uh, the uh, uh, James Burns potato processing plan gets wind of it, he calls all the individual workers in the, uh, to his office to sign an affidavit that they don't belong to the union. And, uh, and if they do, he fires them. And not only fires them, but throws them out of the labor camp into the street. Those that don't sign, he suspects that they belong to the union. They're fired also, okay? So wait a minute, uh, uh, we call the sheriff. He says, Sheriff, these people are being thrown out of the labor camps and they're being deducted for their labor camp uh, uh, facilities every week, uh, a couple dollars a week. They have to have a 30-day notice. That's when I call the lawyer. That's what he t tell that to the, to the sheriff so that he doesn't throw all of you any work. So the labor strike only, uh, only uh, uh, lasted as long as the uh, three weeks that were remaining in the strike because we had no way of how to, how to, uh, how to uh, house uh, 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 scores of families that were thrown out from belonging to the union. We filed unfair labor practice. Remember, Wisconsin protects uh, the right of farm workers to organize collectively. We fired unfair labor practices, and they said a hearing. Not the next day, not the next week, not the next month, in December. Well, we could keep the strike going until December. So we, we, uh, we uh, stopped the strike, and, uh, and, and the uh, Wisconsin Employee Relations Commission, as you suspect, found the employer guilty of unfair labor practices, but we didn't get recognized as a union. Next year, we said, okay, that's not gonna happen again. We're gonna get lawyers. So Fred Kessler, I think he's still, uh, he just retired uh, uh, from the Wisconsin Assembly. Uh, during that march, he had come to the, uh, he had come to the uh, uh, rally at the state capitol when I gave a speech, and I said, uh, he was in, just finishing law school. And uh, he would later uh, become the one of the youngest uh, uh, state uh, assembly persons ever elected. I told him, I said, well, we need his lawyers. I don't know, talk one thing about labor law. Uh, so he got me uh, uh, volunteer lawyers from Milwaukee. We had a, uh, we had a uh, fundraiser to pay for their trip, for pay for depositions, etc. That gentleman in the back uh, to us is Michael McCann. He had just graduated from Harvard University, later became a, 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 a district attorney for Milwaukee County. The gentleman who's standing in, uh, in front uh, is Alan Sampson. His dad developed the uh, Bayshore uh, Mall over there in, uh, in Glendale volunteering. There are others uh, 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 that also assisted. Uh, uh, I met uh, Chavez, I told you, I, I phoned him. He came every year after that. Of course, he's interested in we uh, 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 funding his uh, great boycott. And here he is, he came to Milwaukee. I got some uh, labor leaders to meet him and, uh, and promote the, uh, the uh, great boycott. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, Archdiocese uh, funded the Centro Hispano, uh, hosted the, uh, the reception. Here we are organizing farm workers. Uh, again, we can't go into the labor camps. As soon as we went to the labor camps, we get our tails kicked out of there. So we would have baseball teams. One labor camp would play against another labor camp, hundreds of kids would show up and actually we were interested in uh, the uh, workers that we were organizing them. Because we're going after Liberty, uh, Liberty in a three county area and there's, there were 700 workers. People would say, hey, so why don't you take some of the smaller processors? I said, no, Liberty, no, Liberty is vertically, even and vertically integrated. They got three processors, three canning companies. If we can win in the uh, cucumbers, we'll take them on and uh, improve the working conditions of the cannery workers. So here we are, uh, hey, Chavez calls me up and he says, uh, hey, uh, the Teatro Campesina, this is what uh, uh, gentleman Luis Valdez in the back with the Mexican hat was part of the San Francisco mine troop. And they, they had developed what was called the Unity. In other words, no costumes whatsoever. 
Uh, you're the farm worker, so you write the campesino. You're the church, so you write, have a sign that the church. You're the strike breaker, so you're the esquilor. You're the, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And they would perform these skits uh, developed by, uh, we said, well, uh, Chavez says, we're doing a fundraiser. Can you find a venue for them? We filled Green Hall at the University of Wisconsin campus with uh, Teatro Campesino, promoting the guerrilla aspect, the theater aspect of the San Francisco mine crew. If they would perform it uh, in front of farm workers. So here they are performing in Matoma, Wisconsin, in a theater full of farm workers. You should have seen the kids after the performances. They're all performing these skits all over the labor camps on the weekends in downtown, and nobody wanted to be uh, nobody wanted to be the strike breaker. Everybody wanted to be the campesino or the church or or whatever. The uh, the, uh, the professor Mark Rodriguez, for those of you who read this, writes about this period of time that we organize it, and he calls this organizing social unionism because then I did not you know what social unionism is until I read the term. But what he's referring to is that the Farm Workers Union in California, as well as the Farm Workers Union in uh, Wisconsin, was not interested inclusively of wages, improving wages and working conditions. We had a lawyer's week, we had an office, we had, uh, uh, we'll eventually open up a clinic, a, uh, we'll open up a, a gasoline co op, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. In other words, we were there to provide services. And when we come to Milwaukee, uh, uh, we come with the same idea of organizing families and create uh, 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 services for the individual system we're doing. Well, how are you going to create a, uh, a clinic? Professor Brandeis from the University of Minnesota, Milwaukee, at that time, University Hospitals was uh, part of the University of Wisconsin. Now it's an autonomous uh, uh, part. Got this uh, a group of doctors who are concerned about a breakout of uh, STDs in the, uh, in the uh, student uh, uh, community at the University of Wisconsin. So they had this blue bus, and the color was not uh, uh, by accident. They had this blue bus that they developed a clinic, a diagnostic lab, right? And they would take the bus and, and park it right by the uh, Mifflin Street area, which was the center of students, and they would pass out condoms, uh, 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 and uh, anybody that wanted to come in and check themselves for an STD that they had told a laboratory. So when Professor Brandeis approached Dr. Goodfriend about providing health and services, health services for migrants, he said, let's drive the blue bus to Ottawa, Wisconsin. I got the Catholic Church to give us a former uh, building that they no longer use in the parish, and that's the first clinic for the state of Wisconsin. Later, uh, state money uh, became available, federal funds became available, uh, a local hospital got closed down, and we have some of the finest uh, clinic uh, facilities in central Wisconsin were developed uh, during, during this uh, time. That's what we call social unionism and a type of organizing. Well, 1968, uh, 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 we had one that, uh, that, uh, that uh, Libby McDonald Libby, we got an emergency election by the Wisconsin Employment Relations Commission. There were 413 votes. How many votes do you think the union won? Out of the 413 votes, we got 405. None, none for the union eight. I'm sure there was a unanimous, except those eight uh, votes against the union were errors. But the Libby McDonald and Libby, the first uh, negotiating section that we, that we went to said, uh, I'm sorry, we want to uh, inform you that we're no longer negotiating a contract with Bobelos on either. We're moving all the cucumber operations out of the state of Wisconsin, and we have no uh, need to negotiate with you, nor will we need any workers, because uh, we're not harvesting cucumbers in the state of Wisconsin. You say, you can't do that. We're a representative of your union. You have to involve us in your decision making. If there's jobs that are going to be made available, wherever you take this plan, we would have to have a priority in terms of, anyway, we filed an unfair labor practice with the Council of Employment Relations Commission. They would later find living down Libby, but years later, okay? So Chavez comes up and he says, uh, why that he'd be coming every, every year, including all the rest of his stuff. You know, Jesus, you've been at it for four years and you still don't have a contract. If you help me with a great boycott, I'll help you in Wisconsin. Who the heck was to know that it would take us five years to get the first contract in California? Right? But anyway, I believe that, that if I went to Milwaukee and helped him organize a great boycott so they could win in California, once he won in California, he would come and help us here in Wisconsin. Well, here I go. 
farm boy, never lived in a community more than a couple thousand, living in labor camps for most of my childhood. Now coming to Milwaukee, and I was telling some of the, uh, some of the students, that was a big change. I wasn't used to all the noise, the, the, uh, the uh, ambulances, the uh, police sirens going on, all the people getting the bus running out. Uh, in, in, uh, in our hometown in Crystal City, there was no, there was no uh, uh, street sweepers. If you, somebody threw a piece of paper in front of your house, you get up there, you pick it up, you sweep the sidewalk and here, and your papers were flowing all over the place and just really, but I love the walk. I never recovered, I've been here ever since, so uh, don't think that that was uh, a negative, it's just a big adaptation. So we're gonna take on ladies, we got just like Chavez trying to get the growers by a boycott to come to the negotiating table. We're gonna go to a negotiating table. We're gonna organize all three processing plants and ladies. But I need help. Go downstairs, go down to Texas, my former hometown, and there you got a political revolt going. Uh, the veterans, they organized the water registration drives and they kicked out the 40 year rule by the minority annual colleges. And uh, they have elections. And uh, so they know that what I'm doing because so many workers are coming from our hometown. So here I am, uh, helping them uh, get uh, the state of, uh, of Latino candidates, Mexican candidates, get elected and, uh, and telling them, when you come out to Wisconsin next year, if you come to a processing plant, you're gonna run into us, but we're gonna be organized. This is a plant outside of, uh, of Argo, Wisconsin. There's a, there's a part of uh, Professor Rodriguez's uh, 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 comments on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on the way we organize. He calls us uh, a transnational movement, all right? Well, there's no question about the links between us and uh, Chavez, but these are all farm workers in the, in, uh, from the state of Texas, many of them from my own hometown. The gentleman behind me with his wrist, when we take over the city uh, uh, council of Crystal City, he becomes the first city manager after he, uh, after, uh, this is another picture of him uh, 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 operating our, uh, our cooperative. The, uh, the uh, gentleman with the flag in the, uh, uh, oops, the gentleman with the, uh, with the, uh, I got this now, uh, Professor. <laughs> the gentleman with the flag uh, in the crowd uh, becomes the first representative of the Independent School District. The gentleman next door to him, uh, uh, Tuli Gonzalez, uh, 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 I'm sorry, uh, Rodolfo Palomo, becomes the uh, uh, head of the Urban Renewal, uh, et cetera. In other words, all these individuals that cut their teeth with, uh, we have Obleros and Leos as organizers of the farm workers go back into their hometowns and lead the political revolt. Or that is, uh, take the franchise, uh, organize and become leaders of, the, uh, of, the, of their uh, local communities, including, uh, including Francisco Rodriguez here, who becomes the first uh, uh, city manager, in this, uh, 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 Latino city manager here. He is uh, uh, helping us run the cooperative uh, in the summer. Uh, uh, it was Check out the price of, uh, of, uh, of gasoline, huh? uh, see that? <laughs> 31 cents a, a gallon, huh? and they were making money uh, at that time. Now, one of the reasons why I was noting about uh, why I love those pictures upstairs in the second floor, Mr. Brown, about those families, is because you see all the rallies that we have here are all with families. I show you that at the rally, at the march here, at this, uh, this woman on the left, uh, 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 Eva Gonzalez, uh, I'm sorry, Eva Valenzuela, speaking uh, there. She got fired for wearing a union, but got thrown out of the, again, uh, these growers and processors were just treated us brutally. They threw us out uh, 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 on the first strike uh, for uh, being a member of the union. We left, uh, lost 700 workers, uh, and leaving moved out of the operations. Here, Valenzuela is uh, in her family uh, with a baby is being thrown out of the labor camp. Anyway, we have that, we have that building of the uh, gasoline cooperative. We decide that we're gonna put a tent right behind the building and the gasoline cooperative is a park there. Any further families, migrant families that get thrown out for wearing union buttons while they're working in the fields, we're gonna fill the whole downtown area and the Mill Pond Park with tents and families. No, that's not gonna happen. Now, this is a tourist season, and we don't want all those Mexicans living in tents in the middle of uh, downtown. So uh, uh, Eva Valenzuela spends two weeks there, but while the uh, lawsuit makes his way uh, into, uh, into the court, she wins uh, 
Itchy wins a back day for the two weeks and uh, goes back uh, on her way to Texas happily. And all these families, look, just look at all these children, isn't that wonderful? This is Eva Valenzuela. And again, unlike the traditional labor movement at the time that organized principally male workers, these were organizing families so that, uh, so that uh, Eva Valenzuela, uh, 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 Maria uh, 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 Torres, or we call their cookie, and all the rest of the individuals, what emerges is, uh, is uh, challenges with the role of women within Mexican traditional society. What emerges is a youth movement as a result of this activity. So when we come to, uh, when uh, Chavez uh, 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 tells me or uh, asks me to come to, uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, Milwaukee, we organize in the same manner, and you're going to see the same pictures, but now in an urban area of families, of youths, of women leaders in the uh, community. So I get to Watoma, and I told you, uh, United Migrant Opportunity Services had been funded, and they're still to take you. I said, look, we present the field talking about minimum wage, workman's compensation, rights of workers, and you still are, are about daycare. We have, we need to have this statewide aid organization that receives over $800,000 a year to advocate on behalf of better working conditions for the migrant. So I take that issue before the board of this organization and the, uh, all, the, uh, all the administrators, none of them Mexicans, the Mexicans are the workers are the ones that are at the community level, right? All the administrators and coordinators that are, are non Latino. We take it before the board and, uh, and the administrators get all concerned. Hey, Salas is gonna create problems for we better, we better come up with a demand that the board gives us contracts, right? In order to protect our employment here at the United Market Opportunity Services. So then we argue, we said, you know what these guys are doing? They're after their own skin. They're not there to have a case on behalf of Roker. So the board, the board uh, 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 rejects, rejects the, uh, the uh, demand of the five non-Latino administrators and all of a sudden, you have an $800,000 uh, 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 grant, statewide grant, with no leadership. And I said, what have I done? Just, uh, uh, so what I do is I, uh, I apply for the job. <laughs> and we take over Yuma's. We change the direction of the Yuma's into exclusively a daycare, into employment and training and adult education. We started building self-help housing around the Delavan, Burlington area. We uh, uh, get a, a, a grant to have lawyers in a group so we can advocate uh, legally on behalf of the families, uh, 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 et cetera. And then, uh, and then uh, uh, left and right, uh, you, uh, uh, the Spanish Center, Father Maurice resigns and the Latinos hired. Employment and Training Program Center, Concentrated Employment Center uh, opens up and is run by a Latino. Ernesto Chacon, uh, uh, Latin American Union for Civil Rights sets up the Brown Berets. United Community Center is set up by the, by the, with the support of the churches, uh, 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 et cetera. So within a period of about six or eight months, all the agencies in the South Side are directed by, uh, by U.S., by, uh, by Latinos, okay? We have one problem. All of those agencies, by the, by the way, this is the clinic uh, uh, that uh, uh, Reverendo Davida uh, 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 and the 16th Street Clinic, Reverendo Davida opens up a dental support services, the 16th uh, Street Clinic. The same gentleman that had opened up the clinic in Watoma is a member of the Board of Yuma. I had invited him to come in and help us. He then begins negotiating with the 16th Street Clinic. University Hospital makes a link with the 16th Street Clinic to provide further uh, uh, services. So, in a small area, unlike any other community I ever traveled, you have a complete what we call a sustainable community of social services uh, in a short period of time. Except one problem. Oh, by the way, right down the street from the, the Spanish Center, uh, uh, the NAACP Youth Council and Father Grappi is uh, demanding equal employment opportunity at Adam Bradley. Okay. And uh, I walked down three blocks over there. Hey, Father Grubman, how you doing? My name is Jesus Alas. Hey, fine, you know. So we start getting to know each other. I start picketing with them. When I set up the great boycott, he sends over the commandos to picket with me. Uh, uh, there's an intersection here, and this is very, uh, not noted very, very much. The intersection between the NAACP Youth Council and the civil rights movement and the farm workers movement. 
And uh, at that time, the, uh, the legislature, Republican-dominated legislature, was cutting the safety net or so-called welfare reform. Because see, they're thinking that all these African-Americans that are coming into the, from the South, into Milwaukee, and all of the migrant workers that are now moving into urban areas, I mean, you have just one, that one year we lost 700 workers due to levies, and, uh, and we threw the whole cycle out of uh, whack. And, uh, and they're coming in, and uh, the Republicans were saying, they're coming in because they want our better and higher welfare. So we need welfare reform to reduce the, uh, the benefits so that uh, African Americans and migrants don't be settled here. Well, we marched to Madison, and uh, something's go wrong. Uh, by, the time, uh, by the time we get there, students join us. There's thousands of us that go into the Capitol. The, 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 the National Guard is called. Uh, they fix bayonet. They remove out of there. Father Grappi there in front besides me is ordered, uh, arrested by the uh, state legislature, the federal judge, uh, the father of uh, Jimmy Doyle, the, the uh, last governor. Uh, 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 his dad is a federal judge. He says, hey, the legislature can order uh, the arrest of anyone. They're not uh, sheriff or judge. So then they, uh, they, are, they uh, send for the arrest of me, Brownie, and uh, three uh, 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 welfare rights leaders for damages to the state capital while we occupied the capital. By the way, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Father Grappi is all concerned. You know, he, of all the, he was known, of course, as a firebrand, but uh, he, gets really, uh, he gets really concerned about uh, the violence breaking out as a result of the, because the National Guard continues to stay there and the students, some of them are not part of our group, are you know, provoking them. We're afraid uh, that we're not gonna be able to maintain the order. He asked me, Jesus, is there a, is there a place where I can go and pray? And you know, I, I don't want to deceive you. I'm not uh, really a practicing religious person. I said, Father Grappi, I'll, I'll take you there. The Newman Center is down the street on State Street. We can go uh, and you can uh, 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 and you can pray there. I said, but I'll just accompany you. So I sat down and he's praying. Doors come barging in, the police come over and they pick him up and, uh, and, they, uh, and they jail him. The uh, welfare, the welfare rights demonstrations continue in Milwaukee. Ernesto Chacon and, uh, and uh, Jose Puente are jailed for coming to the aid of a pregnant African American woman. They're sentenced to six months in jail. And we begin hundreds of protesting for their release uh, and for Governor Lucy to demand uh, a pardon. Uh, uh, the previous uh, weekend uh, uh, before this march, uh, we're marching uh, to uh, uh, talk at the uh, at the Milwaukee County Courthouse. Uh, uh, they're coming in, not with horses, but with motorcycles, and they're coming in, they're pushing the motorcycles against us, and I had been in, uh, in a whole bunch of demonstrations by this time. This was a, a, a second or third year in, uh, in Milwaukee. I knew something was gonna happen. I, I, all the years I had been in the field, we had never been uh, arrested. Uh, but there had never, never been conflict and tension, but I had never been in jail. When I got to Milwaukee, I couldn't stay out of jail. When we got to the we got to the march, the uh, we weren't doing anything. This came over and they knew who I was. So the, the uh, sergeant came over there. He just directed the officer, and they arrested me and, and the whole Flores. And that was a big mistake, because then there, all these youngsters started reacting for for them removing me, throwing me into the paddy wagon, and that, and all hell broke loose. There was some construction going on in the back of the uh, of the uh, Fifth Street there. Some of the kids uh, uh, were teed off that I had been thrown in jail. They started throwing bricks at the police. Just a chaos, man. <laughs> and, and I couldn't do anything about it. I was in the paddy wheel and being taken to jail. If I'd have been there, with that wouldn't have uh, happened. I would try not to have that happen. So I'm in jail, and there, uh, and there uh, uh, all these uh, people are coming injured into the, uh, into the jail, joining me. And, uh, and uh, later on, I get out. I'm the first one arrested. I'm the first one out. And uh, and uh, some of the kids that are uh, some of the kids that are arrested, I had never I had never been confronted with this. We go over there, we try to get them out. Say, Salas, you can't uh, you can't bail these kids out. The parents have to go come in and keep bailing them out. Hardest thing ever done, my God. I can imagine. Mr. and Mrs. Such and Such, uh, your son or daughter is in jail. I told him not to get involved with you. Look what happened. Now he's in jail. I said I'm very sorry for what happened. Uh, but you need to come down, they won't release me, my recognizance is, uh, the, you know, we went around the house and knocking on the door, waking up parents to come in and, uh, 
and, uh, and get their children out of jail. This is a, uh, again, the intersection between the phone workers. Here's Roy Barbie on the far right, uh, uh, besides Ernesto Chacon, uh, head of the desegregation lawsuit uh, of the Milwaukee Public School System, Val Phillips, uh, uh, the first African-American woman in the city council, order of heads, the first African-American in the Milwaukee County Labor Council, uh, uh, other heads of, of, uh, of uh, the Urban League, etc. Again, all of them supporting the three point that. We uh, uh, ran the first Latino for the Wisconsin Assembly. Uh, there is uh, the gentleman in the tie in the center, uh, Dante Navato, starting doing registration drives, uh, 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 getting other candidates to run. It took us uh, uh, 1980 uh, uh, redistricting uh, fight in order to get our district protected. So we didn't get uh, Colon to uh, get elected until the 90s. And uh, I don't know if you heard, but we uh, had a very unfortunate experience with the city council thinking that we deserved a third of the Manhattan district and uh, we didn't get it. Uh, we're looking at the situation of the courts, but that's a, that would be, a, we went to the court for the redistricting in 1980. I joined Voices in 2010 and we won the right uh, to have uh, two assembly districts and now we attempted to get two aldermen and did three aldermen districts. We failed. We'll see what we can get. Uh, in one of the agencies that was created, uh, the SPOT, by the way, this is the precursor to the United Community Center, which now hosts uh, Latino arts here and, and uh, the distinguished director of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the gallery there, Latino arts, and of course, uh, the group of that you just heard a little bit uh, earlier. These are some of the school walkouts and the Milwaukee Public School System will not honor the Mexican Fiestas Patrias or the Elise de Se Septiembre Cinco de Mayo. We're working with Lloyd Barr. Remember earlier, he's uh, supporting the great boycott. So he wants us to be part of the desegregation lawsuit and for the bilingual uh, 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 program office to be part of the desegregation uh, 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 lawsuits. And so we're conducting uh, walkouts. Uh, uh, and here you see still just hundreds, hundreds of uh, of students joining the, uh, the walkout. One of the big problems is taking over all those agencies, or so is the administration, is that we couldn't take over the top job. You needed a, a college degree to be a director of one of those agencies. You needed at least two years to be uh, 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 even a, 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 a school aide or a, a social worker aide. So the University of Wisconsin and Milwaukee was crucial in providing services to our community. I enrolled in 1968, as was always the case I told you about, everywhere my dad got us to uh, go to school in Henry, Watoma, everywhere we went, he always enrolled. I came here and I promised my dad that I would enroll at, 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 uh, at, uh, at UW uh, uh, Milwaukee when I got here. He was so disappointed. I started uh, in 1961. Here it was 1966. I should have had my bachelor's degree. Uh, uh, but anyway, I said, Dad, just be patient. There are a lot of things going on. I'll get my, it took me 10 years to get my bachelor's degree. But anyway, I enrolled at UW uh, Milwaukee. Out of 25,000 students, all the Latinos could sit around one table. Okay, 25,000 students. So we started demanding access to the University of Wisconsin. And we, by this time, we knew exactly what direction, direct action was, right? We joined with Groffey, we had March and the welfare marches. He says, yes, you're doing a great job with the great boy. All those leaflets, you know, telling the growers, writing to the growers. You got the address of the growers association there in California for them to write, to give the workers the right. Then you go in, you tell them to, uh, to, uh, to uh, stop buying the grapes, you tell the growers that they're, but you got to do a little bit direct action and you really want some results. What is that, Father Graf? Well, you got to create some tension. Don't let the, the choppers come in all the way to the door. Go up and stop them by the, uh, by the, uh, by the uh, parking lot. And you know, just create a little tension in that. And people don't like to go chopping with police or in front of the doors. Right? So I had learned how to do it. That's why I was talking about going to jail all these times. And, uh, and so here we are in Milwaukee, in Milwaukee at UWM. We did everything that was in the book as far as the back session. We picketed with the Chancellor in effigy. He kept us out there for over a year, by the way. He didn't want, you know, universities are bad bosses. They don't like to be told what to do, right? We wanted an outreach institute, right? We wanted them in the community. The University of Wisconsin was like in another planet. We couldn't even get the students to cross downtown to go to MATC and take care of the vocational uh, 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 programs that all they needed was an eighth grade, let alone for them to drive uh, all the way to the Gold Coast uh, where UWM was, uh, 
was instituted and applied for. So we wanted the university to come over there and there do the testing, there do the financial aid applications, even uh, offer some questions. No, you can do it. We want a director of that institute to be a Latino, and we think it should be Dr. Fernandez, who was a marketing professor. You're not gonna tell the university who to hire. All right, well, we'll see you. And, uh, and so we stayed there over a year. And finally, finally we got it. Uh, 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 we had at that time now, uh, they, we were fasting, right? We were sleeping outside. It was in October, it was cold, wet, damp. And they had a guard there because we had to use the bathroom. And if you've ever been in a chancellor's office, when you walk in, the bathrooms are right there and you don't have to go into the chancellor's office, the first floor, which is mostly promotional material. And then his office, is her, her office is up in the second floor. So they allowed us with a guard there to use the bathroom. So at about 5.30, 6 in the morning, I get up, being a farm worker, I still get up at that time to this day. There's no guard in the door. And I wake up the other people that were fasting and sleeping in the ground and say, hey, there's nobody there at the door. Let's go in. So we went, we went into the door, shut the door, and we started you know, getting on the phones and calling the whole community. By the time everybody woke up, we had buses of, of Latinos coming in. And that's eventually what decided the, uh, the finalization of the uh, Spanish speaking now it's rich institute. By the way, there's over 2,000 students, Latinos, at the now Roberto Hernandez Center. It's a great success. Uh, uh, here we are celebrating the establishment of the, of the Latino, uh, the Spanish speaking outreach institute, where the University of Wisconsin, there's two, 300 people, and we're going out the outline. What is the institute going to be about? How about some of the other community problems? So I'm at the podium. You see those folks in the back? They're organizing a protest against me. All these women that are marching uh, 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 from over there in the costumes here at the bottom of that picture, Irasima Flores, they come up and they take the microphone from me and they says, we're not gonna take this crap anymore from all of you macho leaders. <laughs> what are you talking about? All of you guys, you know? You invite us to these meetings. Where, where would you like to meet right away after we have a political manifestation? At the bar, right? We can't go into the bar with you guys. Uh, so we want to be involved in the planning of the meetings that are non, in places that are non-alcoholic services. And if it is, it's got to be a restaurant. So they took over the doggone meeting and uh, read their demands, and they just were just so flabbergasted. I know what, what to do. They're right. They're right. And that's what I'm talking about. When you organize families, you, you see those hundreds of youth that are moving. You have emergence of a youth movement. You have the feminist movement. There's a book called uh, uh, Latina Women by Tess Arenas and Eloisa Gomez talking about all these women who uh, led these activities and ended up running, uh, uh, having a, a, a special place in, uh, in, uh, in uh, the direction of a social services program. Uh, okay. And here they are all by themselves. They didn't want any matches to be in the, uh, in the media. They're all planning a caucus of, the, of uh, Latina women there. I get a day and I find most of the women who are there because we've all been together for so long. And uh, then they come, then they come with a petition and they uh, read their demands and they make sure that we don't exclude them in the, uh, in the future. Well, there had always been, as if you read uh, Professor uh, 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 Gonzalez, this Edgar Gonzalez's book, Mexicanos in Wisconsin, there have been celebrations of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Mexican Independence Day. Well, we expanded that parade now to include soccer teams, now to include uh, 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 representatives of the agencies, and then after the uh, after the the march, then we have these huge political rallies. And here we are in uh, Fifth Street in Milwaukee, hundreds. And look at the diversity of the crowds after the celebration of those uh, marches. And this is the politics. So this is what we brought to the fore in the uh, in the celebration of the Mexican Patria holiday: the politics and uh, and. Uh, uh, it worked when the uh, when uh, 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 Summerfest is uh, initiated and uh, Mexico Fiesta becomes of it. It's one of the most popular of the ethnic festivals. That year is 2015, 80,000 uh, participants, where it's one of the most successful of the Latinos. Well, so one of the things about uh, uh, that organizing and political uh, 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 activity that we did was a demand for legislature to protect migrant workers. We want every migrant worker that is brought into the state of Wisconsin to have a contract. You're gonna come in, you're gonna, you're gonna be living in housing that's inspected, you're gonna get a minimum wage, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. If you get injured, you're, you're available for workman's compensation. So uh, there was a march. Now, we had marched from Watoma to Madison uh, uh, for enforcement of existing laws 
Here, uh, Salvador Sanchez and uh, Yumas and Chacon and other leaders are marching from Milwaukee to Madison for a, uh, for a, uh, for a uh, uh, Michael Labor Law. Now, I had, uh, I had uh, taken over the agency of Yumas. Uh, I had placed every bill. Uh, my leftist friends would say, hey, Sarah, see, that's when you come to Milwaukee. You come over here, you know, to start up all the uh, best paying jobs here, like Yumas is administrator, CEO. I said, look, I'll just get you what's funded this year and one third get this thing stabilized out soon. All right, I have no interest in being a, a bureau that I'll continue to organize. So I did. I, uh, I uh, finished my tenure at Humus and uh, I finally had graduated at the University of Wisconsin. 10 years, my family was so happy that after 10 years I got my bachelor's degree. I applied for the University of, uh, of uh, first I went home, uh, I had to be gone home for 10 years. I went home and, uh, and stayed with the family. Uh, my mother was having some, some issues and uh, stayed with her, helped out in the restaurant. They wouldn't let me wait on tables anymore because I was so provocative. People would see me in the storefront. I was responsible for all the strikes and then there would be arguments with the local growers that would come in and then so, no, no, you stay and you wash dishes. So I spent the time washing dishes. And then I, uh, I enrolled at the, at the UW Madison. So here comes the march. Here comes the march, and I'm in Madison, and we have been doing all this activity, and I knew all these legislators. So there are four legislative initiatives during my stay and uh, that I organize uh, uh, at Mecha that I call uh, NUMUS, and then Mecha is the uh, name of the student organization, and I'll conclude by, uh, by making these uh, remarks, because this was this took a couple of years. We, uh, we wanted, just like we had done at the University of Wisconsin, but there we had made a, not an error, we had to run far enough that with UW. We wanted academic programs, because we never impacted the hiring. We still, uh, uh, with 2,000 students, Latino students, one of the most active ethnic groups at the university, we don't have it, doesn't reflect the uh, uh, academic support services that we need. So when, we got, when I got to Madison, we said what we want is we want a, uh, a Chicano Studies uh, program, now called Chicano Latino Study because of the diversity of the Latino community. So uh, the dean uh, uh, named me to the study committee and we recommended a department be created. And then when we got uh, back to the dean and told him that uh, the faculty students, I was a graduate student at that time, and uh, had agreed to uh, uh, recommend the department, he said, we don't have any money for it. How much money do you need? $50,000. I'll get you the $50,000. So I went to the state capitol and, uh, and advanced the, uh, the migrant labor law and in support of the, uh, of the establishing Chicano studies. I got the $50,000 and the university was pissed. They don't like to be told where the money that they lobby for, where it goes, or what it's going for. They got the money and they wouldn't spend it. Uh, 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 when we finally put pressure on them and we told the legislature, look, oh, you give them that money to create you, they give it to the School of Education. The letters and science didn't want anything to do with it. So then uh, the, uh, we advanced the uh, Wisconsin, we didn't pass it, we advanced the migrant labor law. And then at that time in 1973, the Chinese students at the, at the San Francisco Independent School District uh, sued the district because they didn't understand the instruction that was going on. That court case, Law versus Nichols, got to the United Supreme Court, uh, United States Supreme Court, and the United States Supreme Court says so you have to teach them English in their own language. So they passed that, uh, and then we have been doing uh, 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 bilingual education since uh, uh, I was in the daycare program, so three or four years. I indicated when I took over humans, we advanced the bilingual education. When the desegregation lawsuit, uh, uh, we joined with uh, with. Uh, uh, Lloyd Barbie, we advanced it kind of, so we passed the bilingual bicultural uh, bill. Later on, we would pass the uh, migrant labor law and then the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, migrant tuition. Any mi migrant farm worker that their parent worked three to five years here did not have to pay uh, tuition. So here we are, this is 1983. This is uh, 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 almost eight years after we have amended the uh, the, uh, the uh, 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 university budget to include Chicano studies. It took us over a decade, and we finally got uh, the program to move from the School of Education to letters to the size. This is the uh, agri-tuition bill that we passed. Here's Mario Caraballero advancing, and we got the sponsors, we got the, uh, we got the votes, and we finally passed that. So all those four legislative conferences, we did that by organizing 
and supporting uh, these uh, initiatives. And of course, everywhere we went, uh, culture, whether it was performing arts or whether it was a musical uh, groups coming to uh, to uh, Fiesta Mexicana, uh, or in this case, this of the Hermanos Avila uh, dancing in uh, in the uh, front of uh, Bascom Hall. The uh, the farm workers boycott, of course, was won eventually by Cesar Chavez. But now the farm workers in California, I'm sorry, the farm workers in Florida. Remember, we were talking about the migrant stream. One of them was in uh, Florida, the sort of tomato workers. So uh, the student groups still, uh, at this time, now supporting instead of the farm workers in California, supporting the farm workers in uh, in, uh, in Florida. And to end uh, uh, the activities that are going on today is. Uh, uh, protecting our essential workers, and these are the undocumented workers. Nearly 50% of all the dairy industry, uh, uh, Wisconsin's primary industry, uh, is uh, is run by uh, uh, undocumented uh, undocumented uh, workers. Uh, the uh, Republican legislature took their right away uh, to uh, to uh, uh, have access to uh, to uh, driver's licenses. So here you have uh, University of Wisconsin students supporting Boston de la Frontera. As uh, uh, the professor indicated earlier, I was a member of the board, so every time that I get to uh, Madison and talk to the students, I ask for their continued support of Posse de la Frontera issue and for rights of the, uh, of the undocumented, which are a major issue in our, uh, in our community. So I want to thank you very much for, uh, for your efforts. Uh, I want to especially congratulate uh, uh, Jacobo Lobo and you, Professor. It was so much fun to be able to work with the students. Uh, only a professor of social studies would, uh, would engage the honors program like uh, you have. And uh, I, I told you that I graduated in 71. It took me 10 years to get a bachelor's degree. So I got my graduate degree. I passed my, uh, my, uh, my qualifying exam for a PhD and got my graduate degree in 1985, 14 years later. Uh, uh, and then started, uh, people, people think uh, that I'm uh, joking. Started my second life in, uh, in the academy. First for 20 years in, uh, in MAPC and as a lecturer in, uh, in UW Madison. So you guys were very important to me. I was so happy that, uh, that uh, the professor included you. There's others that, uh, that were here that were part of the group that are uh, happy. I want to congratulate you. Wish you, uh, wish you well. One of them wants me to do a podcast with them, so <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's not over. Thank you very much, and thank you for your